July 2nd, 1863. 150 years ago today, perhaps the most famous portion of the Battle of Gettysburg was fought. That being General Longstreet's attack on the Union left flank. Longstreet, who made up the Confederate right, had delayed most of the day, took a while to get his troops into position, and suffered heavily from critics for not attacking sooner. General Lee had envisioned General Longstreet launching his attack in the, at least at the very least, late morning, early afternoon. But Longstreet didn't get well underway until in the late afternoon and into dusk. Longstreet's attack in echelon along the Union left toward their center pressed the Union forces to the breaking point at several points. The Union were pushed back through the Devil's Den, pushed out of the wheat field, and driven up to the tip of the little round top hills. Initially, when the attacks began, the Union line didn't extend so far south. They were in a much more condensed position. As the attacks gained steam and the Union troops were pressed, Union rushed reinforcements from their right flank along a hill known as Culp's Hill to the Union left flank toward the Round Tops, where the famous fight between the 20th Maine and the Confederacy took place. While these battles were taking place, General Lee's Lieutenant General Ewell had orders to press the Union to his front. Ewell was on the Confederate left or the Union right, opposite of Culp's Hill. It was his responsibility to make sure that the Union troops there were being pressed hard enough so that they wouldn't be able to reinforce the Union troops on the left. In this, Ewell failed. He delayed most of the day, and when Longstreet's attack, which was also delayed, finally began occurring, instead of pressing the troops to his front, as his orders were, he launched an artillery barrage. Throughout the fighting on the Union left, Longstreet continued to press, and the Union continued to divert reinforcements away from Culp's Hill and towards the Round Tops. This, interestingly enough, presented a situation of great opportunity, but once again in reverse of what Lee had initially intended. Lee had n intended Ewell to press the Union on Culp's, allowing Longstreet to overwhelm the Union on the left, a double envelopment a tactic which officers would typically attempt ever since the days of Rome when Hannibal used it successfully against the Romans to crush the Roman army, I believe at Cannae. Instead, however, it ended up being a fragmented attack on the Union left, and the Union right was more or less secure almost the entire day. It wasn't until Longstreet's attack had petered out that General Ewell decided to move his troops into position, who had been ready for an assault for some hours. He launched his attack against the Union troops on Culp's Hill, which now mainly only com consisted of one brigade left from the Union 12th Corps, which had been stripped away from Culp's Hill, to go reinforce the attack against Longstreet, or against the attack by Longstreet. Now, there were other Union forces in the area, the First Corps was resting in the area and took up positions also along the northern face of Culp's Hill and also toward Cemetery Hill, but the First was bloodied from the first day of the battle. As you may remember from my previous vid video, the Battle of Gettysburg was a traumatic affair on July 1st where the Union First and Eleventh Corps were driven from the field. So while the First Corps was in the area, it was hardly a full-strength corps. Confederate corps were also typically far larger than the Union. The Battle of Chancellorsville, which took place only two months prior, saw roughly 50,000 Confederates engage some 100,000 Union. And while the Union Army of the Potomac was significantly larger, it was not three times as large as the Confederate Army when the entire army was at place, which was not the case at Chancellorsville. But the point is the Union Army, or sorry, the Confederate Army was divided into two wings, basically, under Lee's two most capable lieutenants. General Longstreet commanded one wing or one corps of the army. General Jackson commanded the other. When Jackson fell at Chancellorsville, Lee had to reorganize his army. He didn't have another Jackson to replace his casualty. He didn't have another Longstreet either. Longstreet, who Lee had made his second 
in command by making him slightly higher ranking than General Jackson just after the Peninsula Campaign, by date of promotion. Longstreet, trusted, Longstreet was trusted by Lee as his old war horse, but Lee had no one he felt similarly about. General A.P. Hill was a choice. He had served with distinction under General Jackson. So had General Ewell. Hill was probably more like Jackson in the aggressive manner. Ewell was not as aggressive as Hill, although Hill had his own failings, where often he would act before he was ready. Jackson was probably the combination of both, rushing to get into position, but also being able to be ready by the time he would launch his attack. Hill sometimes would rush too much and wouldn't be totally ready, although he had saved the army at the Battle of Antietam by force-marching his army to the, to the aid of General Lee. And so, without another Longstreet, without another Jackson, without someone to take up that second wing, without someone who he trusted to command half of his army, General Lee reorganized the army before the Gettysburg Campaign. Lee split his army into three wings. Longstreet would command the First Corps, the Second Corps would be commanded by General Ewell, and the Third Corps by Hill, General Hill. The bulk of these two new corps were made up from, Long from Jackson's wing, but Longstreet's corps was also slightly reduced to compensate, so that the three corps would have roughly the same striking power, or at least on paper the same number of divisions. Now General Ewell missed an opportunity at the end of the first day of the fighting. July 1st, when the Union Army was withdrawing, Culp's Hill here was largely abandoned. General Ewell was given orders by Lee to attack, although Lee often worded his orders in a more recommendation sort of way and less of a forceful, you need to attack here, which was very different than what General Ewell was used to. He had been serving under Jackson, who would often leave no room for doubt of what his orders were. General Lee, on the other hand, issued his orders, as I said, in an advisory manner. So he would say, take this hill if practical, with the full expectation often that the orders would be followed. You see, Lee was brilliant in many ways, but in some others he left a lot of the details of attacks and orders up to his commanders. Therefore, he wouldn't issue explicit orders, but often would issue more general orders. I think this can be summed up by looking at the Battle of Second Manassas pretty well, actually. Where General Lee was obviously in command of both Jackson and Longstreet's wings in 1862 during the battle, and he would request General Longstreet to send reinforcements to Jackson. Longstreet protested, planning an attack, taking his time, while General Jackson's force was being pressed back and nearly overrun. Again, Long Lee would ask if Longstreet would be able to send reinforcements. Eventually, Longstreet would, but not until after he had initiated an attack on his own accord. Now, Lee issued the attack as well, but Longstreet had seized the initiative. He had launched his attack before Lee's orders actually arrived. This was often the way that Lee would treat his corps commanders. He would give broad, overreaching orders with attacks at certain points, maybe units involved at certain points, and leave the details up to his subordinates. This was perhaps more freedom to these corps commanders, Jackson and Longstreet, than he would have afforded other corps commanders later in the war, who he did not trust so much. Often by the end of the war, Lee was micromanaging his corps, because he simply didn't have as capable of officers in command. In the Overland Campaign, Longstreet would be wounded at the Wilderness, and Lee was often taking the role of a corps commander and an army commander. He no longer could leave broad orders up to his subordinates. And in fact, you would often see similar problems plaguing the Union, although in the reverse. Union commanders would often give orders to corps commanders, but if they weren't specific about what they wanted, Union corps commanders were not always as enthusiastic about their commanders. The Army of the Potomac really had a uh, revolving door of commanders, so it, it is understandable that often there was political differences within the, the army, and this hindered them. So it, it's safe to say that this is kind of the way that a, an ideal situation, I think, would be safe to say a corps would be, would be handled in this way. 
that Lee was handling his his force. But the point I'm trying to make after rambling for a bit is that Ewell was not used to this uh, freedom in orders. And perhaps that's why he didn't do anything at the end of the day. Maybe he didn't really understand what Lee had wanted. Maybe he didn't want to risk it without an explicit order to basically cover his tracks for the actions he would commit. But either way, he failed to attack on July 1st. And that allowed the Union to reinforce the hill. General George Green, the commander of the one brigade remaining on the hill from the 12th Corps, which was left on Culp's Hill by late in the day on the, on the 2nd of July, had spent that day digging or building barricades and breastworks. Green was, before the war, uh, actually someone who would have been well suited to this type of work. Before the war started, he was actually a civil engineer, and so while only 1,300 men possessed a line of over a half a mile in length and were being attacked by an enemy force more than four times their number, these defenses allowed them to hold their ground. A very thin position, a very thin line existed along this entire line, and you can see in this battle, um, which, by the way, if I didn't mention, this is once again from Scourge of War, Gettysburg. Um, but as you can see along this line here, there are very few troops. An ideal defensive position would have one man, you'd see sprites along the entire length of breastworks along this hill. That would be what an ideal situation would be. No gaps, no, just one solid line, and maybe some reserves even. Um, but as you can see, I don't have enough men to spread out. I could spread out in skirmish formation, perhaps, um, but that probably would have been closer resembling, or at least a singular two, two thin ranks without reserves, would have been closer to resembling what actually occurred on this fight. Now, when the attack began, General Green's troops held out they did get some reinforcements, as I already said, from the 1st Corps, and there were a couple of regiments, I believe from the 6th Corps, which were also pulled up. But essentially it was a vastly outnumbered Union force behind well-built breastworks, um, holding out against superior Confederate numbers. Now, this attack would have been successful if these breastworks were not there. In the words of a Union commander, or a Union uh, enlisted man, I'm sorry, the, had the breastworks not been built, there would have been only the thin line of our unprotected brigade. That line must have been swept away like leaves before the wind by the oncoming of so heavy a mass of troops, and the Baltimore Pike would have been reached by the enemy. Now this is important because the Baltimore Pike was the line of communications for the entire Union Army. Had this line been cut, the Union Army would have been put into a dangerous position. This battle on the Union right was ever so important, just as important as the attack on the left. And yet it gets very little significance. General Green was all along his line, encouraging his men, fighting with his men, being involved in the fight. And yet very little attention is paid to him today in posterity. Perhaps that's because the, so the single greatest figure on the Union left, uh, General Joseph Chamberlain, was a professor and wrote after the war of the experience and was able to uh, convey his message and garner sympathy and garner fame uh, not for his own self-serving purpose every soldier wants to be recognized every soldier wants their story told or maybe not every soldier but it's certainly not a crime to want your story told um, no such hero emerged from the attack on the Union right, even though General Green performed just as admirable a task. Perhaps it's also because standing behind breastworks and firing back at the enemy was not viewed as manly and not viewed as a healthy fighting spirit. You would often see early in the Civil War units simply refuse to build breastworks or refuse to dig in. Officers wouldn't even try it. It wasn't considered an honorable way to fight. Although, the attacks on Culp's Hill would be eerily similar to many attacks that would occur as the war went on. For breastworks here showed just the potential that a smaller defending force could have against an attacking force. Similarly, 
the Confederate positions earlier in the war at Fredericksburg once again had shown what a strong and well-defended line of fortifications, even if they were pre-built stone walls, could afford. Tomorrow, the 3rd of July, will mark the anniversary of the attack on Pickett's Charge, another example of the defenders holding out against massively superior numbers because of a good defensive position. Now, I don't know because I haven't read how important uh, these engagements were in changing the mindsets of the officers, but it became clear time after time when defenders w had good positions they would hold and they would lose far fewer than the attackers. That troops began to build breastworks wherever they went by later in the war. Gettysburg was not yet that point. After Gettysburg, not another major fight would occur when that wasn't the case. The wilderness may have been the last large stand-up fight without significant entrenchments. In 1864, every single major engagement other than the wilderness took place with significant entrenchments being dug. Cold Harbor, Spotsylvania, just the overland campaign in general. So this may have been one of those last great attempts where Lee would have a chance in an open field fight. But the problem is Green had beaten him to the punch and had erected fortifications which proved too strong for the Confederates to break. They would attempt again on July 3rd and again they would fail. Now, interestingly enough, Ewell was late on July 2nd. He was too early on July 3rd, although through no fault of his own. And as a result, the Battle of Gettysburg played out as a series of uncoordinated attacks that simply did not go according to plan. A, simultaneously fl a simultaneous flanking assault with one line pinning and one line anviling did not work on July 2nd. July 3rd, again, Ewell was supposed to delay attack right when Pickett was attacking the Union Center and overwhelm the Union troops and prevent reinforcements from coming to the aid of the Union Center. Once again, Ewell failed, and this time he was, he was attacked early, so the fight on Culp's Hill started before charge. If Ewell had attacked earlier in the day, it's possible the reinforcements never would have left Culp's Hill. Now, many of those reinforcements never reached the attack Longstreet was in issuing, so it may have made no difference. But it also would have interrupted the building of the fortifications. There have been some who have claimed that this delay allowed Green's troops' fortifications to be far more thoroughly completed than otherwise, and that that had an impact on the attack. It's hard to say whether that's true or not, at least with the information that I have at my disposal. I won't claim that Ewell would have overrun the 12th Corps because, again, if he had attacked when Longstreet had attacked, he may have run into far more forces. But. It certainly was another situation where the battle did not go according to the plans of Robert E. Lee, and ended up being a bloody repulse for the Confederates who were mowed down in the open while the Union sat behind their fortifications. In this battle, much as in the real battle, I sat behind my fortifications. I was overwhelmed on my right, just as the Union was historically, where the Confederates did nearly turn their flank, but I have been able to hold. The Confederate attack is spent, and a historical result looks likely from this battle. Thousands of Confederates litter the battlefield. Interestingly enough, Green's troops, despite the strong protective barriers, also suffered heavy casualties, both in this game and in real life. Things for certain. General Green, who also happened to be the oldest fighter on the field, did a wonderful job on July 2nd, 150 years ago. And his role in this battle was just as important as General, or sorry, at the time, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain. In fact, had he not built his fortifications, as many other Union officers simply didn't or wouldn't want to at this time, he would have been overrun and the Union flank would have been crushed. The right man was at the right place at the right time for the Union Army, once again. Interesting that Green, age 62, had the foresight and the wisdom to know what would be best 
far more so than his younger compatriots. Perhaps it brings meaning to the word, to the saying that age brings wisdom, but it definitely flies in the face of a lot of stereotypes in military, where older officers are unwilling to adapt and change to new tactics. In this case, Green was willing to adapt and change. At least sitting back and waiting, as many other officers would have done, he had his men dig in and save the Union Army. Maybe not in so dramatic a fashion as the attacks on the left, but on the right, it was just as critical. And after all, in war, do you really want things to come down to the wire? Or do you want to win handily and significantly and easily? As I said, Green's troops were nearly overrun, but considering the odds, it was a pretty easy victory for them. Anyway, at this point I'm just kind of rambling. So I'm gonna cut this short, or not really short, I've kind of... I've cut out a lot of this battle. This battle was originally an hour-long scenario, and I cut it down to about 22 minutes, so there's probably a lot of jumping around and things like that. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you for watching. This is the Historical Gamer. I didn't focus as much on my gameplay on this one. I focused more on just kind of talking about some history behind the battle and uh, the figures involved. So um, if that's something you like, uh, definitely let me know in the comments. If you prefer me talking more about I'm moving this regiment here or this regiment here, uh, definitely let me know that as well. I did that because this is a longer scenario. And to be honest, uh, in a defensive scenario like this, I didn't move around a whole lot. There was a brief period in the beginning of the battle where I did have to adjust my forces, but for the most part I didn't move my troops around all that much. Anyway, this is the Historical Gamer, and tomorrow I will have the final part of this uh, three-part 150th anniversary to the Battle of Gettysburg. I'm posting all these scheduled. I'm actually out of town, so... Um, I probably won't have any more videos after tomorrow for at least a week, uh, possibly more. Um, I'm on my honeymoon, so um, this is all scheduled to come up, but it's not all live. But anyway, without getting into too much details, I don't typically talk about my personal life on here. And like I said, I'm definitely rambling at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and end this video, and I just want to say thank you for watching. Uh, keep the thoughts of the uh, gentleman who fought this battle 150 years ago in your hearts and in your minds. And uh, this is the Historical Gamer, signing out.